Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay, so today I'll be sharing with you the results of the archaeological works completed by AOC last year in relation to the drilling of the southernmost stretch of the A9. I'll be providing an overview of the most significant features we discovered for each land parcel along with our early stage interpretation of each site. <clears throat> the works focused on an approximate 9.5 kilometre stretch between the village of Lunkerty to the Pass of Burnham. The investigation took the form of both invasive and non-invasive archaeological investigations, comprising of office-based research and geophysical survey, but also through an a program of invasive travel trenching and subsequent, subsequent excavation. The area of excavation was divided into 15 land parcels, with some of the larger parcels being divided further for ease of reference. The excavations focused on six sites, which you can see up here. Land parcels 4, 5, 6.2, 6.3, and 6.5. These are the areas that demonstrated archaeological potential based upon the results from the earlier phase of geophysical survey and trial changing. All excavation sites were located on the high ground in close, pro, close proximity to the Ordi Burn. The works revealed a number of prehistoric features ranging from the early Neolithic to the late Iron Age. <coughs> so, starting in the southernmost point, Land parcel 4 lay to the west of the A9 and was formerly part of Northeast Farm. The excavation revealed a prehistoric ditch, a multi faced souterrain, two prehistoric roundhouses, two small four post structures. <clears throat> and a further 50 pit or postal features. Artifact analysis and soil sampling have demonstrated the likelihood of two to three phases of activity ranging from the Neolithic to Iron Age. Looking at these features in a bit more detail, starting with the roundhouses, roundhouse 4.1 was located along the eastern edge of the excavation area, consisting of eight post holes and two internal pits. Roundhouse 4.2 adjacent consisted of six post holes and lay to the immediate west of 4.1. As you can see, both roundhouses are circular in plan, with the second being notably smaller, with half the post holes surviving. It is assumed that the missing post holes of 4.2 had been removed due to ploughing activity or the creation of the modern ditch scene. Scene <laughs> just there. <clears throat> The roundhouses are a typical example of a Type 4 Iron Age house, consisting of an internal post string that would have been likely surrounded by a turf wall or a bank for supporting the base of the roof. Oops. <coughs> you can see, excuse me, you can see here that the footprint of the houses overlap, indicating two phases of building on this location. The nearby structure 4.3 a four-post structure is considered to be related, possibly representing a small outbuilding used for storage of grain or other foodstuffs. It is likely that the similar structure to the south serves a similar purpose. To the west of the roundhouses, and probably contemporary to at least one phase of the roundhouses, were two large features identified as a suit train with multiple phases of construction. The suit train would have measured 21.2 metres in length and varied in width from 0.98 metres to 2.0 8 metres, and in depth from 0 0.97 metres to 1.34 metres. The lower part, um, designated as 4.098, has been um, determined as the original construction, with pit 4.104 as the um, original engines. Initial steps into the train from this pit are likely to have been removed when the upper extension 4.101 was added to the northern edge. The extended suit train was created using a different construction technique, with the feature made wider with more moderate slopes and 10 post holes seen along here placed into the sloping sides at the northern edge of the feature. Six of the post holes are regularly spaced along the western edge, but only two are present along the eastern edge, with a further two at the entrance. The only two opposing post holes can be seen here, possibly indicating a door set at 2.5 metres into the suit train that would have measured 1.08 metres wide. The suit train would have been entered from the northwest into this extension, 
with an initial step and then moderately sloped floor along its length until the slope became more gradual into the main passage. The entrance comes abruptly to the south at this point and then curves southeast where it connects the original suturing. The passage then curves gradually to the south southeast and continues along its length before narrowing for the final seven metres. The terminus of the suturing was curved rather than having a vertical face. Very little artifactual evidence has been recovered from the excavation of the subsequent post excavation work, though of some interest is a fragment of unidentified prehistoric pottery from the basal deposit and a large fragment of charred timber found near the entrance. It is hoped that further analysis of these will assist in dating the suturing. <clears throat> so, part of a very large linear was present at the northern end of the excavation area, entering the site from the western edge in a line northwest to southeast and curving to the south southeast where it terminated. This feature was prominent in the geophysical survey, but only part of it lay within the site boundary. The ditch was quite deep, at 1.2 metres in depth, though it became shallower at the terminus. Some fragments of burnt bone and a single piece of unidentified vitrified ceramic fragment were found during the excavation near the base. At this early stage of the post-excavation process, the ditch is considered to be either Neolithic or early Bronze Age in origin, serving as a possible closure ditch or similar structure. Given the width and depth of the ditch, it is possible that it would have had a defensive or monumental function. Possible comparisons can be made with Neolithic Hens monuments that are known to be 2.6 metres wide and 1.2 metres deep from the excavations at Balfarg and the Huntington Tower. If this is the case, this ditch potentially represents the earliest activity within the site so far. Recent discussions from my colleagues, though, have suggested that this, in fact, could also be a second suturing because it matches similar dimensions and alignment to the suturing to the south. So this is something we're still trying to figure out. <coughs> See, unfortunately, the majority of the structure lies out with the excavation area, so its actual purpose hasn't been fully determined. So moving on, land parcel 5 lay to the east of the A9 and was formerly part of Marl Hall Farm. Land parcel 5 was noted to be, have considerably deep topsoil deposits, particularly the edge closer to the A9. To overcome the issue of spoil storage, this land parcel was excavated in two phases, designated 5A and 5B. So far, none of the samples of this land parcel have been processed, nor have any artifacts recovered during ex excavation. Therefore, any interpretations so we have achieved so far is purely speculative. So the excavation of land parcel 5A revealed four furrows, five curved new features, seven small to medium sized pits, a postering structure consisting of five post holes and four very large pits. The curved linear features were likely to be contemporary with one another and are possible remnants of small subcircular structures. The nearby postering was formed by five post holes of varying sizes, being either circular, circular or subcircular in plan with an internal diameter of 4.8 metres. At present, these structures have been tentatively identified as temporary enclosures or storage areas. The four pits, like many of the features from land parcel 5, are difficult to interpret. They are most notable due to their size and depth, measuring between 2.01 metres to 2.8 metres in width, and 0.58 metres to 0.82 metres in depth. Like the other features, they contain no artifactual evidence. At this point, their size and location within the areas of sandy, sub sandy substrata suggest they may be quarry pits. It is unknown if they relate to the other features from Land Parcel 5. Um, land Parcel 5b was found to contain little of note, uh, note except for six sterile pits and five furrows, so we figured there's no need to really continue on with that. So moving on, uh, Land Parcel 6.2 lay to the east of the A9 and was formerly part of Newmill Farm. Similar to land parcel 5, it was opened in two phases due to spoil storage uh, problems, hence the lines you can see here. <clears throat> the excavation revealed a field boundary or furrow and 11 pits. Now, land parcel 6.2 <clears throat> doesn't look as interesting as other areas, but the pit cluster concentrated within the centre of the site represents the earliest activity we've discovered throughout the entire excavation so far all focused around this small pit seen just here. As is often the way, this small and rather unassuming pit was found to contain a shared of early mythic carinated bowl and a well-crafted flint arrowhead, by far the most exciting finds we've recovered so far. So despite land parcel 6.2 contained two of the most interesting finds, it also contained the fewest number of features of any of the excavation areas, making interpretation difficult. Initially, the features were considered to be used for waste disposal, 
possibly for hair from domestic waste, as seen by rich charcoal deposits seen in some of the pits. However, considering the high quality of these two finds, this stage seems unlikely. The carinated bowl and arrowhead suggest that Neolithic activity is happening here, but the main focus of this is possibly out with the excavation area. Carrying on, uh, land parcel 6.3 lay to the east of the A9. The area is adjacent to Newmill Cottages and was formerly part of Newmill Farm. The excavation of land parcel 6.3 revealed two linear features in 26 pits. The linear, the linear seen here to the far right was a trackway identified on Roy's military map of Scotland at the western edge of site. Similar to land parcel 6.2, 6.3 contained no structures, with remains being mostly pits. The pits located toward the north and south of the area contained fragments of prehistoric pottery, later identified as impressed ware, which date to the middle slash Neolithic period. <coughs> Land parcel 6.5 lay to the west of the A9, partially situated on a moderately steep slope, and was formerly part of Newmill Farm. The area was found to contain the highest number of features of any of the excavated areas. Now, I apologise for the chaos you're looking at. Um, <laughs> I've been looking at it for the last uh, year now. But I'll do my best to show you the main structural features we've discovered, but I don't think I'll have time to cover all of them. Um, these include one prehistoric roundhouse. <clears throat> um, one parcel four post structure, two palisades, seen here and here, um, a grain kiln, seen in this area, and a further 79 negative features. This high concentration of features is likely the result of land parcel 6.5 being a continuation of the RNA settlement excavated by Watkins in the 1970s. Watkins site lies to the immediate east of land parcel 6.5 on the opposite side of the A9. The features within land parcel 6.5 belong to multiple phases of activity, which I will hopefully better demonstrate in a later slide. The artifact evidence and radiocarbon carbon dates confirm at least two separate phases of prehistoric activity occurring during the middle slash Neolithic period and the Iron Age. The earliest phase of activity is represented by two separate clusters of pits seen here. <clears throat> These contain fragments of middle slash late Neolithic pottery, along with several flint artefacts dated to the same period. The features to the centre and south of the site are considered to be Iron Age in origin, based on the presence of a roundhouse found towards the south, metalworking fragments found within pits near the centre, and the proximity to the identified Iron Age settlement to the east of the A9. It is hoped that datable evidence from the post excavation analysis will support this theory. Now to look at some of these features in a bit more detail. The roundhouse towards the south of the site has been recognised as a Type 3 Iron Age roundhouse based on the typology established uh, by the excavations at Kintora in 2008. Unusually, the roundhouse was built on a slope and was thought to be constructed using material from excavated from the two large pits nearby. Seen there and there. To create a level surface or platform upon which to build the house. Immediately north of the roundhouse is the first of two palisades. The most subtle of these is considered to be contemporary with the roundhouse as well as the two pit alignments, which I'll cover in a second. During the excavation, it was revealed that post holes had been created at the base of the, of the palisade to a certain extent, suggesting the structure was partially post built. The second palisade, identified as structure 6.4, lay to the north end of site and comprised of two linears, with the gap in between being interpreted as a possible entrance. It has been suggested in this early stage of interpretation that these two structures are evidence of a change in boundary and are considered to be two separate phases of activity, though both features are considered um, typical palisade types encountered at Iron Age sites. Now I've got a bit ahead of myself, so I need to go back a wee bit. In the centre of the site, we identified two pit alignments. Um, these two pit alignments, identified as 6.9 and 6.10, are something of an unknown entity on site. Um, they lie to the immediate northwest of the southern palisade. <coughs> Sorry, of the southern palisade, 
and appear to lead to a cluster of four pits, three of which that were rich in metalwork and fragments. There was also evidence of burying present within the deposits, and many of the post holes showed signs of truncation. Several of the post holes contained packing stones, likely for post settings, therefore no of these features may have, start, may have served a structural purpose, acting either as an avenue or possible support for a structure otherwise entirely removed. So this is just um, the profile of the pit alignments we had so far. Um, the new activity on site is referenced by two pit clusters and two separate semi-permanent structures. The pottery recovered from these clusters was the greatest concentration recovered during the excavations and after analysis dated the activity to the middle slash late Neolithic. The presence of carbonized residues on the interior surfaces show that many of these pots would have been used as cooking vessels. Other evidence of domestic activity can be seen in the high concentrations of charcoal and heat affected stones within the deposits of the pits. Um, just a brief word on these. These were the two structures um, which we suspect acted as windbreaks um, or similar structures for these domestic activities just mentioned. So, interpretations so far. As mentioned, we are still in the earlier processes of post excavation work but the artefacts and limited soil samples assessed so far have provided evidence of a broad spectrum of prehistoric activity from the early Neolithic to the late Iron Age, a period of roughly four and a half millennia. With the remainder of my time, I'm going to show our current phasing and interpretation of the excavated areas thus far. So the remains at Land Parcel 4 are likely part of a larger Iron Age community and focused around the, um, forgive my pronunciation here, these Scotchy, Ordi and Gelly Burns. The majority of features within these, this area are considered to be Iron Age, based upon a limited number of environmental samples processed, as well as structural typology as seen with the roundhouse and souterrain. It is hoped that the Iron Age features discovered will be roughly contemporaneous and may represent a settlement that existed on the periphery of the main Iron Age settlement at New Mills towards the east. It is also accepted, however, that further environment analysis will show some of the pit features to be of different periods entirely. The features within Land Parcel 5 may represent a collection of semi-permanent structures and quarry pits. Given the proximity of the features, it is possible that they are related to the nearby Marlhall Hall enclosure east of the area. The combination of poor preservation of features within this land parcel and the absence of find prevent a more robust interpretation at this time. Within Land Parcel 6.2, the single shared of Neolithic carinated bowl and the finely worked front arrowhead retrieved from one of the few features in this area demonstrate that the human activity taking place in this area is considerably earlier than any other land parcels. The purpose of these features is unknown. They may be outlying features of an unknown settlement, remains of a travelling group, or possibly part of a ritual activity as denoted by the deposit of high value artefacts such as the arrowhead. Land parcel 6.3 contain a moderate range of isolated features forming no obvious structures. The pottery retrieved suggests activity on site was concentrated toward the middle slash late Neolithic period. Several of the features uh, contained inclusions that showed no signs of burning, but none of which appeared in situ. Similar to Land Parcel 6.3, their purpose is mostly unknown at this time. The current working theory is that they likely represent outlying features of a settlement located outside the excavation area, determined by several of the pits showing the evidence of burning activity from possible heritage disposal in relation to other land parcels, other land parcels. The approximate date of the pottery from this place is in a similar period of the Neolithic phase in land parcel 6.5. The features within land parcel 6.5, like land parcel 4, were part of the much larger Iron Age settlement focused on the Stocky, Ordia and Gelly Burns area. The site is most likely a continuation of the large settlement at Newbills, excavated by Newmill by Watkins in the 1970s. On the east side of the existing A9, <coughs> Artifactual eco, excuse me, artifactual and ecofactual evidence recovered during the excavation suggests a site occupied in the middle slash late Neolithic and Iron Age. The Neolithic activity was concentrated primarily to the west of the site, with Iron Age activity focused on the east and south. Pottery retrieved from the features identified as being middle slash Neolithic seem to have been used primarily for cooking. The metalwork and debris in present and similar features suggest that Iron Age industrial activity was taking place alongside the settlement in this area. So, what conclusions can we draw from our findings so far? The excavations of this phase of the A9 joint have revealed a range of prehistoric activity, including both habitation as well as work areas for cooking and metalworking. 
These activities range from the early Neolithic to the late Iron Age, often situated within the close proximity to each other. The larger areas, such as land parcels 4 and 6.5, suggest they form part of a much greater settlement. However, in several areas, our interpretation is hampered due to a limited number of features and artefacts as seen in land parcels 5, 6.2 and 6.3. The post-excavation process is ongoing, and once our analysis is complete, we are hopeful that the results of the recent excavations will improve our knowledge of the prehistoric landscape of the Perth and Kinross area. And with that, thank you for listening.